All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our January 20th St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton Medical Grand Rounds. Um, we'll get going um, and uh, uh, because we've got an action packed session this morning. So we'll get the next slide. Um, and we'll start off with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And so with that, I would like to um, welcome all of you this, this uh, morning and as well welcome our three speakers. We have Drs. Flavia Borges, Sandra Ofori, and Michael McGillian. Uh, presenting three major areas to improve perioperative care and outcomes. So they're going to be presenting about the HIP attack 2 prevent and PVC RAM 2 and 3 trials. We're going to get uh, an excellent overview this morning. And uh, I would also like to welcome our St. Joe's Healthcare Hamilton cardiology head of service, Dr. Vikas Tandon, uh, who is co-hosting with me this morning, and he is going to introduce our three speakers. Thanks, Madeline, um, and uh, thanks uh, to our speakers for presenting today, and thanks uh, to all of you for joining today. Um, this is a very exciting time in the area of perioperative care, so uh, it's fantastic uh, that our three speakers uh, were able to present to us uh, today uh, on these three very, very uh, key and important topics uh, with uh, a lot of great new information in the area. Um, so I'd like to present uh, Dr. Flavia Kessler-Borges. Dr. Kessler, uh, Flavia Kessler-Borges is an internist and assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and in the perioperative care division at McMaster University. She is also an investigator at the PHRI, Population Health Research Institute. Dr. Borges undertook her master's in health sciences and her PhD in cardiovascular sciences in Brazil. <laughs> She undertook a postdoctorate and a clinical perioperative vascular fellowship under the direction of Dr. P.J. Devereaux at McMaster University. Her research is focused on perioperative cardiac biomarkers and perioperative strategies to improve patient outcomes in surgical patients. She holds an internal career research award from McMaster University and is the principal investigator of the HIVATAC 2 trial. Um, so welcome, Flavia. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Sandra Ofori. Dr. Sandra Ofori is a cardiologist and perioperative care clinical fellow and PhD candidate uh, in health research methodology here at McMaster with us. Um, she is also an investigator with our perioperative care group uh, at the Population Health Research Institute. She holds a master's in preventive cardiology from the Imperial College in the United Kingdom and a bachelor's of medicine and surgery from the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. She is a fellow of the West African College of Physicians in Cardiology uh, and uh, following completion of residency training in her internal medicine and cardiology at the University of Port Harcourt in, Arge uh, in Nigeria. So welcome uh, Sandra as well. And then finally I'd like to also um, uh, welcome Dr. Michael McGillian. Dr. Mike McGillian is an associate professor uh, and assistant dean uh, and research in the School of Nursing at McMaster and a scientist at the Population Health Research Institute. He is a nursing leader of the Division of the Perioperative Care Group, uh, working with colleagues on post-surgical virtual care and patient remote automated monitoring um, and the studies that are associated with these. So welcome uh, to Mike as well. Um, I'd also like to take uh, a moment to acknowledge Dr. P.J. Devereaux. Dr. Devereaux, uh, unfortunately, was not able to be uh, with us uh, this morning due to a significant deadline, uh, 
Uh, but Dr. Devereaux, as many of you know, is a cardiologist and perioperative care physician. He is the head of the division of perioperative care um, uh, in the division of, in the department of uh, health uh, evidence and impact, uh, HEI. Uh, he's the senior scientist and scientific leader of anesthesiology in the perioperative medicine group um, with the PHRI. And Dr. Devereaux is a full professor uh, with uh, the health research methods, evidence and impact department, as well as the Department of Medicine. Um, and he is the president of the Society of Perioperative Research and Care. Um, uh, and more closer to us, he's a mentor to many of us uh, and uh, has uh, been very gracious and generous in helping shape many of the ideas uh, that uh, will be presented today. So uh, without further ado, um, I will hand it over to Flavia. And uh, this series of talks will be three short talks. Uh, and what we'll do uh, for um, uh, efficiency in time to make sure that uh, all three short talks get presented, uh, we will save the Q&A for the very end. Uh, but do uh, write down your questions and, uh, and have them ready for the end. Um, and uh, hope everyone enjoys the talks. Thank you. Thanks, Vikas, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will start uh, this set of talks um, with a little bit of um, introduction about um, myocardial injury and hip fractures. I will just go over quickly about the conflicts of interest. So myself and Sandra, we don't have any conflict of interest and Dr. Mike Magillian, uh, he received just in kind support and equipment for projects uh, from Philips and CloudyX. We have three uh, main learning objectives for this talk. Uh, the first one is to gain insights into the prognostic relevance of myocardial injury in patients presenting with a hip fracture and the potential of accelerated surgery to improve outcomes. Understand the huge missed opportunity that perioperative smoking cessation represents and potential for interventions to address this problem. And to become informed about the importance of surgical transitions from hospital to home and ways that we can address this problem of high ER visits, pre-hospitalizations, drug errors, pain, suboptimal medical management for long-term care health. But as I said, I'm gonna start uh, with myocardial injury and hip fracture. That's the topic that gives you some introduction about the hip attack two trial. So I will start with the case. Uh, and it's a case that represents a lot of our clinical practice. So about 10 years ago, Dr. Devro had a patient that was a 73-year-old female in the emergency room, and he was called to be counseled for a lady with a hip fracture, but she had troponin elevation. And then the referring physician from ortho indicated that um, the patient had a heart issue that had to be treated before the hip fracture surgery occurred. So this patient had troponin elevation with some ST depression, she also was dehydrated. She received a lot of fluids. She ended up being in heart failure. She was transferred to CCU. And then because she met criteria for non-STEMI, she was taken to the cardiac cath lab. She had a lesion. She ended up doing a PCI. She started on dual antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation. She had major critical bleeding and she ended up dying before even fixing the fracture. So despite the best of intentions with the medical managing, prioritizing the myocardial injury, the patient ended up dying before she was able to have surgery. Of course, this was an isolated case, but we raised the question of whether it would be better if the patients were managed with accelerated surgery and fix the trigger that was causing the myocardial injury as opposed to do a delay in her care and do more medical optimization ahead of the surgical time. So there, at that time, there was a lot of literature of observational studies comparing accelerated surgery with usual care. That's usually 48 hours to perform surgery. And the literature was pointing out that likely there was benefit of mortality in terms of accelerated surgery, but there was no trial on this topic. So we know that the hip fracture is very common. It's associated with patient important outcomes. And the hip fracture is a trauma that causes immobilization pain and bleeding. 
that will trigger inflammation, hypercoagulability, catabolism, and stress state. And this all together can cause clinical complications, including infections such as pneumonia, thrombolysis, stroke, and myocardial injury and myocardial infarction. And this is a pathway to premature death in many patients. So we performed the HIPATEC-1 trial. It was published in The Lancet in 2020. And in this trial, we randomized almost 3,000 patients comparing accelerated surgery versus the standard of care for hip fracture, meaning that in the accelerated care group, we had the goal and we achieved the goal of six median hours for surgery after orthodiagnose compared with standard of care that in the trial was usually 24 hours to perform the surgery. It was an international randomized control trial we performed in more than 15 countries in 69 centers. And overall, our primary outcome was all-cause mortality and a major composite of complications, including stroke, major bleeding, myocardial infarction, all-cause mortality, sepsis, and venous thrombolysis. So in the whole population, when we look into the results, there was no difference comparing accelerated surgery with standard of care in terms of decreasing mortality or the composite of major complications. However, there was a lot of concern from our physician community to perform accelerated surgery and actually cause harm to the patients, but there was no evidence of harm, even in the subgroups with acute medical conditions. And when we look into secondary outcomes, there are some important outcomes that accelerated surgery demonstrated benefit. Accelerated surgery reduced 28% in delirium, reduced 20% urinary tract infections, improved moderate to severe pain scores, was associated with almost one day in terms of faster mobilization, standing, and full weight bearing, and also a shorter length of hospital stay. And we did perform a subgroup analysis based on the index case that I presented to you, looking into accelerated surgery in patients that had elevated troponin on hospital arrival versus no elevated troponin. And accelerated surgery demonstrated mortality advantage on those patients. So here is the subgroup analysis looking into 90-day mortality. So you can see here that was no overall difference in the trial. However, when we split the cohort between patients that had elevated troponin on hospital arrival, the first information you can see here is that with the standard of care, our usual care that we are doing right now, their mortality is 23% at 90 days. It's very high if you have a troponin elevation compared to 9% mortality if you don't have troponin elevation on arrival. So there's no debate. They are a very high risk group. And when we look into the intervention, actually accelerated surgery was associated with 10% mortality compared to 23% mortality in the standard care group with a hazard ratio 0.43 and a p-value for interaction statistically significant. We look also in a secondary composite outcome for this cohort with patients with a cardiac biomarker available. And this secondary outcome was a composite of all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, stroke, and congestive heart failure. And it's the same message. If you can see here, the patients with elevated troponin at baseline had 14% complications of this secondary cardiovascular outcomes at 90 days, compared to 30% in the standard of care, has a ratio 0.43, the value for infraction statistically significant. Then we look into the levels of troponin because we know that it's a biomarker of mortality. And the, usually the higher the troponin, the higher the mortality when we look into myocardial injury after surgery. Here is myocardial injury after the hip fracture before the surgery. Here is the standard care group. And we look into HIPATEC-1 in terms of third tiles of troponin elevation because we have several different assays across the sites. So we could not come up with a threshold of a value because we cannot combine different troponins. We look into third tile. So here it means that um, patients with greater than 2.5 times the upper limit. So let's say your troponin level, the upper limit is 30. Patients with 75 or greater would have 30% mortality at 90 days compared to 9% mortality in patients with no troponin elevation. 
And then we look into the impact of the intervention based on the elevated troponin. So as you can see here in this table, it seems that the higher the level of the troponin, the higher the benefit of accelerated surgery. Of course, here we are talking in the subgroup analysis, so we don't have a lot of power in terms of the p-value for interaction. But as you can see here, the hazard ratio for mortality starts dropping. And in the group with higher levels of troponin, hazard ratio comparing accelerated surgery versus the standard of care is 0.17%, understanding that we have few patients. So this is just hypothesis generating. So from HIP attack one, we saw that, in fact, myocardial injury is common. One in five patients with hip fracture were presenting in the emergency room with acute myocardial injury. Their mortality is threefold higher, and the higher the biomarker, the higher the mortality. And there's absolutely no guidelines on how to manage those patients. All our guidelines in perioperative medicine give us directions on how to manage post-operative myocardial injury, but not pre-operative myocardial injury. The ones that meet non-STEMI criteria, all the guidelines suggest that we follow the guidelines for non-STEMI. However, those guidelines are not taking into consideration that this patient has an acute hip fracture and the management, maybe it's completely different because we cannot take all those patients to the cath lab because they were gonna receive the antiplatelet therapy anticoagulation and they will bleed. So they were excluded from all acute coronary syndromes trial in cardiology. So this population is not studied at all. And in terms of the data we have from HIPATEC-1, accelerated surgery in hip fractures, patients with myocardial injury seems to be safe. It may improve mortality at 90 days and it may be even more beneficial in patients with higher biomarker levels. So we designed HIPATEC-2 to answer this question with the hypothesis that patients with a hip fracture and a baseline troponin elevation, they will benefit from accelerated surgery by reducing the time those patients are exposed to those harmful stress states of hypercoagulability, bleeding, and inflammation. And here we make an analogy with upper GI bleed. If a patient comes in with an upper GI bleed and troponin elevation, there is no discussion that we are going to transfuse the patient and control the bleeding. And there is no um, debate if we should manage the troponin elevation because we need to manage the trigger. And here is the same logic that we are applying for hip fractures. So we designed HIPATEC2 to randomize 1,100 patients. These are older, frail patients with frail to hip fractures, uh, but they have to have a baseline troponin elevation to be on the trial and hospital arrival. And then once they meet eligibility criteria, um, ortho is gonna be involved in the diagnosis and the OR feasibility, if it's possible to accommodate this patient um, in the OR within six hours, ideally from ortho diagnosis. And then we are gonna randomize the patients either to accelerated versus standard of care. Standard of care is the usual care in the institution and accelerated care, we just try to expedite time for medical clearance and also for OR access. And we'll follow all patients for all cause mortality at 90 days. So far we have 59 confirmed sites internationally in 19 different countries. And we have uh, six active sites. And I have the pleasure to say that St. Joe's is active and we are looking forward for our first patient. So in conclusion, HIPATEC-1 taught us that accelerated surgery is not a panacea for all patients. However, it did reduce delirium, urinary tract infection, improve pain scores, and also time for mobilization and early discharge. And patients with troponin elevation in the arrival, they may have mortality advantage with accelerated surgery. And we hope that HIPATEC-2 will answer this important question, and we would appreciate your help in undertaking this trial. Thank you so much. So I'll hand over to Sandra. Thank you, Flavia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes discussing our perioperative smoking cessation program. Next slide, please. Um, my goal this morning is threefold. One is to hopefully show you that smoking is still prevalent in the surgical population and highlight some of the gaps that um, exist in the care of 
these patients. Secondly, I'll present some evidence for smoking cessation interventions. And then hopefully, thirdly, we'll discuss a strategy that we think will be effective for smoking cessation in the perioperative setting. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, of the over 300 million people who have surgery every year, around 60 million are smokers. And the research done by the perioperative care group here at McMaster has highlighted, um, identified a huge gap in smoking cessation in the surgical population. We undertook some analysis from the vision study and you all are familiar with the vision cohort study, which was a large multi-country prospective cohort study involving over 40,000 adults who were undergoing major inpatient non-cardiac surgery. In this cohort, we um, categorized adults who were smoking in the four weeks before their surgery as current smokers, and 14% of the population met this criteria. So the prevalence of current active smoking in, in this multi-country study was 14%. The median pack year history of smokers was 30 years. So these were um, long-term smokers. And interestingly, 62% of these patients across all the centers um, stopped smoking only on the day of or the day before surgery. Only about 7% of these current active smokers obtained smoking cessation medication in the perioperative period up until the time of discharge. Next slide, please. Um, what we found in this analysis was that at 30 days after surgery, only about 38% of these patients who had stopped smoking for surgery remained abstinent. And at one year, it wasn't much different at 40%. So 60% of patients who were actively smoking before surgery went back to smoking right after surgery. And majority of them did so within five days of, of, um, of having their surgery. This is a huge um, gap. What we did find was when we looked into um, predictors of abstinence after surgery, we found that patients who were smoking up to the time of surgery were most likely to resume smoking after surgery, not surprisingly. However, we also found that patients who were using any form of pharmacotherapy actually um, were more likely to stay abstinent after surgery up until 30 days. We um, looked into major vascular complications at one year, and this was a composite of death, non fetal MI, and stroke, and we found that patients who were smoking at baseline were 13% more likely to have the major vascular complication at one year compared to people who were not smoking. So what we learned from, from vision really was a good proportion of patients presenting for surgery were smokers. Majority went back to smoking right after surgery, and only very few, less than 10%, were offered any form of smoking cessation medication around the time of surgery until they went back home after surgery. And that's really a huge gap in current practice. With regards to interventions for perioperative smoking cessation, there, um, we are currently undertaking a systematic review meta network meta-analysis of all the perioperative smoking cessation interventions. In this review from over 6,000 um, papers, we, we identified 20 that met our eligibility criteria. And basically what is showing in summary is interventions that um, involve long intensive behavioral counseling plus or minus pharmacotherapy seem to be the most effective at producing sustained abstinence from smoking at 30 days after surgery and up until one year. However, this search, um, we're currently updating this review because there's been um, newer studies published in the last three years. And so these data will, will definitely will change but it's showing that patients who um, get intensive counseling, mostly starting at least four weeks before surgery, tend to do better than patients who um, get more brief advice or just only pharmacotherapy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, the perioperative guidelines for smoking in, for um, across different um, societies, all recommend smoking cessation. Um, and the recommendation really is for um, combination of behavioral counseling plus or minus pharmacotherapy, preferably started up to five, preferably started four weeks before surgery. However, most of these guidelines are based on um, largely low quality evidence. And we do realize that there are some barriers in the smoking in the perioperative setting 
um, one of which we're all familiar with, which is limited time for delivering intensive um, interventions in the period in the pre-op clinics, as well as we cannot discount the cost of treatment. So depending on where the patient lives, they may or may not have drug coverage for these medications and they are not, the cost is not um, insignificant. Next slide, please. So we um, are therefore looking at new strategies um, that we can apply in the perioperative setting that may um, produce benefits. Oh, and we're looking at two, two main interventions. So pharmacotherapy, and behavioral counseling, because we know that the combination of that um, is likely to be more effective than either alone. So with regards to pharmacotherapy, um, there's a medication called Citizen. Um, it's a naturally occurring plant-based um, drug. It's actually the same plant from which Varenicline Champix is derived. Champix is actually just a modification of Citizen. It's um, a partial nicotine acetylcholine um, receptor and antagonist. So basically patients, um, when they are on citizen, have less craving for smoking, and smoking is actually less pleasurable. In Canada, it's approved as a natural health product, and we think this will be appealing to patients who tend to not want to be medicated when they're trying to quit smoking. And of all the available smoking cessation medications, it's actually the cheapest. So the, cor the current standard regimen lasts about 25 days, and it costs about between $50 to $65 per, per treatment regimen, compared to $300 for Bionicline. With regards to behavioral counseling, we think that given the barriers of time to deliver this counseling, we, we think that if we're able to deliver counseling through text messages, which majority of people um, in Canada across the world have access to mobile phones that can receive text messages, and we can deliver these messages to people wherever they are, whenever, um, this will help to overcome the barrier of time in the perioperative setting. Next slide, please. There's been several studies that have looked at um, citizen and text messaging for smoking cessation, but there's been none at all in the perioperative setting. The existing studies kind of show promise for the effects of these interventions. But however, we know that the perioperative, the perioperative setting can be um, unique and therefore um, evidence or things that seem to work in non-surgical settings may not necessarily have the same effect in surgical settings. So um, we think we know that this is something that is worthwhile to test in our um, surgical population. So given this, we are designing or we have designed the perioperative smoking cessation trial, which we call PREVENT. It's a two by two factorial um, randomized control trial. And our, so our, our research question is, among adults who are undergoing major surgery within 28 days, will a strategy that is looking at citizen versus placebo and in a factorial design text messaging versus standard care, will this um, increase the proportion of patients who, are, who have sustained continuous abstinence at six months post-randomization? We'll start with a, feasibility, with a pilot study to assess the feasibility of a large multi-center definitive randomized control trial. For PREVENT, what we're doing is we're gonna screen patients from the pre-op clinics and from surgical um, offices. And when patients meet our LGBTC criteria and provide consent, randomize them to citizen or placebo. And in the factorial um, um, design, randomize also to text messaging versus standard care. We will deliver the intervention over the course of eight weeks and we'll follow every patient for six months with, with follow-up calls at 30 days 56 days, which is the end of treatment, and at six months to collect um, um, data on our primary outcome, which is sustained abstinence from smoking. We have obtained a grant to start this pilot in the Hamilton, um, si Hamilton sites, three sites in Hamilton, of which St. Joe's is one of the sites, um, Jurevinsky and Hamilton General Hospital. And we we'll truly, truly appreciate your help in undertaking this important trial. In conclusion, we we know that smoking increases post-op post complications and more importantly, impacts long-term health. We know that major, many patients who are having surgery are active smokers and currently very few are obtaining the help they need um, to help them stop smoking in the period period and even long-term. We need new strategies that are consistent with the timelines in which we see patients. It's all good if we can institute this strategies four weeks before surgery, but we know realistically that we see majority of our patients days to weeks just 
a couple of weeks before their surgery. So we need strategies that we can implement given the reality of this timeline. And we believe that findings from our multi-center RCT, evaluating citizen and mobile health technology through text messaging will have the potential to inform our clinical practice. Thank you very much for listening and I will hand over to Mike. Thanks so much, Sandra and Flavia. So I'm pleased to talk with you today about our post-discharge after surgery, virtual care with remote monitoring technology trials. Uh, and we'll focus in on particularly PVC RAM 2 and 3. So just by way of background, in terms of a general background for virtual care with RAM, we all know that COVID-19 has seen a surge in virtual care. We're all involved in it in one way or another. And so uh, in terms of an operational definition, virtual care is really about the ways healthcare providers remotely interact with their patients through phone or computer. And remote automated monitoring is our use of technology to obtain data regarding patients' biophysical parameters, such as blood pressure and temperature. So early in the pandemic, we know that our hospitals had needed to cancel elective surgeries, but semi-urgent, urgent, urgent and emergency surgeries continued. And patients discharged after non-elective surgeries have a 20 to 25% incidence of acute hospital care. Uh, so readmission or ER visit within 30 days. And so um, after hospital discharge, patients usually see a physician within two to eight weeks and are not monitored. And it is our strong feeling, I think we'd all agree that this gap can result in delays in recognizing and managing complications, uh, which can lead to rehospitalization and poor outcomes. And so early identification and management of complications may reduce ho acute hospital care and our program is about the use of RAM technology to do that. So just a little bit about experience to date. So um, in 2021, we undertook the PVC RAM 1 trial. So this was during um, wave two and three of the pandemic. This is the end of wave one. And we randomized 900 patients to virtual care with RAM or standard care. Our outcome adjudicators were blinded. And we included patients who were age 40 years and over discharged after non-elective surgery, and we included nine centers in Ontario, Alberta, including our centers here. So um, what did we see in PVC RAM 1? So high rates of acute hospital care after discharge post-surgery. So even in uh, the standard care group, when people are reluctant to come back to hospital, we saw a 27% rate of people returning to hospital uh, post-discharge in the standard care group. We also observed high rates of drug errors. So 30% identified in virtual care um, on average. And we found patients had at least a minimum of two drug errors detected each. So using our virtual care with RAM approach, we were able to find these drug errors, which were clearly quite common. There were high rates of pain after hospital discharge. So we observed that 60% at 15 days and 45% at 30 days in the standard care group had unrelieved post-operative pain. So um, what we did find in that trial, and I'll get into the details of our approach when we speak to PBC RAM 2, was that virtual care with RAM did not affect our primary outcome of days alive and at home, but increased identification and correction of drug errors and reduced pain. And in centers where the protocol was optimized, so where nurses were able to identify problems based on the triggers and vital signs thresholds we had set, or based on assessment concerns, uh, and then intervened to escalate uh, those concerns to a, an available perioperative physician, we found um, really significant reduction in the use of acute hospital care. So here in our area, we found a 40, 50% relative risk reductions in acute hospital care, brief acute hospital care in ER visits. And so <clears throat> this experience uh, was very valuable for us in learning. And of course, it's only credible to expect that virtual care with RAM can impact outcomes if it really identifies problems and we ultimately change care for people, keep them out of hospital. And so um, moving on to PVC RAM 2 and 3. So with PVC RAM 2, the primary objective again is to determine the effect of virtual care with remote automated monitoring technology compared to standard care on acute hospital care during the 30 day follow up after randomization in adults who have undergone non elective surgery. And so secondarily, we're going to look again at hospital readmission, emergency department visits, our ability to detect and correct medication errors, our ability to detect 
and intervene with surgical site infection and our ability to um, assess and identify um, unrelieved postoperative pain and manage it. We'll also look at optimal management of long-term health among patients with atherosclerotic disease, and this is building into some of this work into our, into our studies. So PVCRM2 is again an RCT with patients being included who are 40 and over being discharged after non-elective surgery. This time we're randomizing 2,000 patients to virtual care with RAM for the first 30 days versus standard care. And so here's a look at the intervention approach. And so this is an evolution from PVC-RAM1. And so I can get into the details here. For people who are uh, randomized to the virtual care condition are sent home with technology provided with to us by CloudDX. And so they have a tablet-based computer and RAM technology. So Bluetooth enabled vital science equipment to patients to measure their blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, blood oxygen saturation, their temperature and their weight for us in the morning. Um, they also complete a daily recovery survey. So they complete uh, a survey that pertains to items that are common concern to patients, such as how concerned are they about constipation or pain, for example. Um, our nurses then, who are especially trained in this model, conduct virtual video visits uh, with these patients that are pre-scheduled um, for regular assessment on day, the first full day at home, so day one, day three, day seven, day 15, day 22, and 30. So just about every seven or eight days, we do a pre-scheduled interaction. Um, and in those interactions, nurses uh, assess post-operative pain. They also conduct the medication reconciliation in order to detect drug errors. Um, we offer this service um, ideally 24 hours, seven days a week. And nurses are able to escalate concerns to the physician team as required based on threshold and assessment. And so we do get data from the patients daily nurses observe that on the triaging dashboard and then um, we'll reassess the patient and escalate um, on an off-cycle visit to a physician as needed. A key difference between PVC-RAM2 and PVC-RAM1 is that this time we will not allow centers to change the thresholds. So in PVC-RAM1, as we were gaining experience, we have set thresholds for vital signs, which, which set off triggers for the nurses to escalate care to a physician. Um, this, uh, and in that trial, we allowed those thresholds to be changed as people got used to the model and gained experience. And we now know that when escalation is optimal, uh, the model functions best. So in PVC RAM 2, the thresholds are in place, will not be modified. And so, uh, again, we're fortunate to have um, an available perioperative physician team at our sites who will conduct virtual rounds daily with the nurses. So we round on the patients daily, and that allows our team to uh, be tight in terms of case review and maximize learning uh, and manage the patients efficiently. Next slide. And so um, what is the importance of PVC-RAM2 for us building on PVC-RAM1? Well, we know that if patients are being discharged from hospital after inpatient non-elective surgery, they're at risk for acute hospital care, that's for sure. And so eliminating surgical backlog is part of um, what we're doing here, um, what we're all trying to do. Uh, and so keeping people at the hospital is an important part of that. And so we know virtual care with RAM holds promise to reduce acute hospital care. And so building on lessons learned, optimizing the thresholds that we have put in place, uh, PVC RAM 2 may have a crucial role to play in relieving our current health system pressures. So interestingly, PVC-RAM2 was our next planned trial, um, which we have yet to start. And we made a pivot as a group, and many people on this call are involved in this, uh, to move forward first with PVC-RAM3. And so in PVC-RAM3, we now focus on people undergoing elective surgery, and we're looking, it's an opportunity to examine the impact of uh, virtual care with RAM on index length of stay. And so the primary objective here is to determine the impact on index length of stay during the first 30 days post band when patients and surgeons uh, have prior knowledge to surgery that a patient can receive virtual care with RAM after discharge. Uh, so this is an RCT again of 2,500 patients. And so just a quick snapshot here, secondary outcomes are quite similar to PVC-RAM2. 
And this time for elective surgery patients, our intervention uh, model is different. It's a 14 day model, including daily vital signs, uh, vital signs being taken by our patients, uh, as well as wound photography that is reviewed by our nursing staff. Uh, we again feature virtual nursing and physician visits with a day one visit, a day three visit, and a day seven visit, um, and a day 14 visit. And our physicians also interact with the patients on scheduled visits at day one, day seven, and day 14. Um, we again are looking at medication reconciliation and providing access to the team so that uh, we can manage the patients. And so in terms of progress for PVC-RAM uh, three, the first patient was randomized on December 29th. Um, and we have 20 patients enrolled to date, and I think one more this morning. And so, you know, this is a huge shout out to the entire community who's involved, uh, has been, uh, it was a major effort to pivot to focus on elective surgery patients now, while those pressures um, in terms of the backlog of elective surgery need to be addressed. For nearly two years since onset of COVID-19, we do face unprecedented backlogs of elective surgeries that we're working through. And virtual care with them may have an important role to play in reducing length of stay also for elective surgery patients by maximizing hospital bed capacity and our surgical throughputs. And virtual care with RAM also holds promise to reduce acute hospital care among the adults who are discharged after elective surgery. And so just in terms of some key lessons that we've learned across these trials to date, um, is that we know it's essential to have standardized vital signs thresholds and protocol that both clinicians and patients adhere to. That requires having a responsive team uh, who are constantly helping us to iterate the model and refine it, um, and also supportive infrastructure and approach. <clears throat> and so we have learned that ideally, when staff are co-located, we're better able to discuss cases and build that culture of excellence around uh, virtual care. That also helps build confidence, and it also assists us with protocol adherence and monitoring. And so um, Flavia, Sandra, and I want to acknowledge there's a very large community involved in all of these studies. There are many people, um, and so listed here, there are many others as well who are central to this work, who have major leadership roles in their own right. And I, of course, want to give a shout out uh, to Rahima, who's our clinical site leader for the St. Joe's Division of Perioperative Care. There are other leaders as well who are very involved in this, Anthony and Billy, Dina Burnett, uh, many people um, who have worked hard uh, to help us get to this point. So we want to say thank you so much. And I think, uh, Flavia, we're now ready for discussion questions. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for that uh, incredible summary of all the important work that you've been involved in leading and uh, that is on the horizon. So um, we, we've got quite, quite a good crowd here today, and uh, I'm sure there are a number of questions. I will start out with one question uh, from Dr. Mitch Levine. And the question is, in HIPAA-TAC-2, won't standard care already include somewhat accelerated surgery since everyone knows about HIPAA-TAC-1? Hey, hi, Mitch. Uh, thanks uh, for this point. This is important, uh, but I think there's some differences still in terms of um, patients with acute myocardial injury. So although we, we know the results from HIPOTEC 1, we, we do understand it was a subgroup analysis. And I didn't mention that we never mandated by protocol to do troponins before randomization. This was done at the discretion of physicians. So actually just half of the patients had measurements and just like 320 patients had elevation. So we are talking about small numbers. Um, so when we go across all trials that did HIPATEC-1, although we believe that accelerated surgery uh, is the right way to go, uh, there's a lot of concern to proceed with accelerated surgery in patients with elevated troponin. And when we look into HIPATEC-1, those patients that had troponin elevation, actually their times for surgery in the standard of care were a little bit delayed. In the overall trial was 24 hours. For those patients, it was almost 30 hours. So I think this is something we're going to be looking closely in terms of the timelines. 
uh, but there's still a lot of concern talking to all the community in terms of, you know, mostly anesthesia team that um, I don't think we're going to end up expediting in this center of care, but this is something we're going to be looking very closely into timelines because the sites report right away. Uh, and we look this prospectively, how um, the adherence to the intervention is going and how these standard of care hours is playing a role as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and then we have Dr. Ann Holbrook who has not one, but two questions. So Ann, please feel free to uh, share those with us. I'm limiting in, uh, in respect for others have many questions. So uh, first of all, I just wanna say kudos. I mean, this group has revolutionized our thinking about periop care. So congrats. And these are all excellent uh, ideas for trials. I have a, a brief comment for Sandra, maybe a question and a bit more for Mike. So Sandra, um, I don't know if you know, but there's a few of us that are clinical pharmacologists on the call and natural health products is Health Canada's code word for saying we are not going to regulate this product at all. Uh, we don't do any quality control on it. We make no guarantees of whether what's on the bottle is, uh, is actually in the bottle. So um, when you're using a natural health product in a trial, you've got some extra hurdles uh, to climb around standardization and making sure you've actually got what you think you've got uh, there. Um, so that's the first question. And Mike, as you know, we've chatted about the medication safety stuff, Periop, and I'm not at all surprised that MedRec is problematic. Um, but the importance of those medication uh, you know, discrepancies is what we usually call them has been kind of questioned. So I'm sure you've got great data on that. But my larger question is you've got sort of two themes to what you're doing, the assessment of vitals and do vitals cross a threshold where like in our setting, we might call race or whatever. And right. then you've got the theme of medication errors. And I just wondered if you could speak to the importance of each and particularly for med errors, what were the key things that you thought were most important? Sure, and so um, shall I pass to Sandra to comment first on your first question? Sure, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, and that was, that's a really important point. And um, I am aware of this, and part of what we've been doing so far, we've, we've actually talked to PIs of other studies and trials, just kind of to figure out how they did, did that. And I think the, the sort of best case um, scenario which we're gonna employ in this trial is, try as much as possible to use one, one supplier of the medication and get all their quality control information. And um, luckily there is one um, supplier in um, Canada and um, I've, I've just only yesterday gotten their contact and I, we plan to pursue this and just try and get as much as possible um, quality control information from them as opposed to you know Health Canada um, um, standards, but that's the best I think we can do. I and I, I also think it's very important that you mentioned this. And I, I think a gap that I've just realized is that we don't have any clinical pharmacologists on the team, which I think is important for us to have. So we have to consider this. Thank you. And thanks so much for your question. So in terms of the vital signs thresholds, I mean, these, these are crucial because we need to have a system for recognition of you know, early identification of potential problems and patient deterioration. And so um, the, there's, there's definitely room for improvement and we've done this in a couple of ways. And so in the PVC-RAM1 trials, it's important to, uh, PVC-RAM trials rather, excuse me, it's important to understand that the vital signs, the equipment we're using uh, is capturing episodic vital signs, right? So we are asking patients to take vital signs for us typically three times daily. And then that will, um, if it's a 30 day protocol for non-elective cases, it's uh, in the last two weeks, it's twice daily. And so we're reviewing those um, on a dashboard and looking, you know, do vital signs, um, are they out of bounds with the parameters we've set? And that will give guidance around how quickly do we need to then revisit the patient and potentially escalate to a physician. So we do first check recheck patient's vitals to make sure it is an artifact or, you know, um, was the dog sitting on the scale along with you? What happened there? 
uh, and then verify and then escalate. But you know, it's all about our signal to noise ratio and getting that right. And so as we keep doing it, the vital signs are based on the best guidance we have uh, from our surgeons and our physicians who were involved in this, um, and we continue to refine them. As the program moves forward, we are going to be working on automation and much earlier identification with studies like Vision 2, using technology that will monitor people continuously with multiple parameters uh, so that we can really get into early identification uh, sooner. Because often when we're detecting issues, it can be too late, particularly in, uh, for models we're using in hospital. And so um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of work to do there, and I think it's really early stages, but it's promising for sure. We have, there's no doubt we've caught uh, many things that the team have intervened on where patients could be in serious trouble. In terms of medication error and de detection, typically what we're finding is that the vast majority of um, error is the patient not understanding the instructions or what should have been stopped, uh, what should have been resumed, um, and what's new that the patient is on. So the way that we are uh, reviewing uh, the medications and doing that reconciliation is based on what is the patient meant to be on from being discharged? What is the intent versus what is the patient taking? And so this is a, an area of learning for us and thank you for your guidance so far. Uh, certainly, we have seen other errors too in terms of, you know, things getting missed, soft lists, and prescriptions not being given. Um, so there's there's so much room for improvement, even around how we are asking the questions and assessing it. Um, there may be areas that we're not catching. So, and I'm probably raising more questions than answering your question. I think. Hey, thank you so much both for those uh, questions and those answers. Um, I see that Dr. Rahima Nenshi has her hand up, so I'll uh, invite her to unmute. Hi, everybody. Thanks Thanks so much for including me. Um, first of all, huge congratulations to Flavia and Sandra and Mike on this incredible work. Um, I just have actually uh, two comments. Um, the first comment I wanted to make is, is you know, from the St. Joe's perspective and learning so much from this group and being involved really interesting time to be working in this area, particularly because of the really huge and unprecedented surgical backlog. Um, and so I think that one of the really unique aspects of all this research that's happening in periop, but particularly with the remote monitoring, is that there's such an appetite to implement this that it's, it's, it's a very um, quick sort of research to clinical turnaround time, which has been um, unique and it's offered some challenges, but also just a, a really uh, interesting amount of support from various uh, sources and also just very satisfying work that is implemented. So my own patients who've been in um, the surgical transitions or the PVC RAM trials really have really benefited from that lower bounce back rate to hospital, improved medication reconciliation, pain control, and you can just see it immediately. So from the surgical point of view, I think I saw Dr. Khan here and I know he had some patients in it as well. It's really been very impactful and um, really nice to see how quickly it's turned into the clinical side. And then the second, just a quick plug that I wanted to say that we are trying to continue to build our pair up um, group clinically at St. Joe's as well. And it's been a very, uh, it's a very collaborative, multidisciplinary team. So for those uh, who are on the call, and if anybody wants to discuss more involvement on the St. So side with um, the growth that we're hoping to have in Periop, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or Mike or Sandra or Flavia, um, and would love to chat about opportunities in research and otherwise. So just wanted a little plug. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nanchi, and uh, huge thanks to you as uh, head of Division of Periop Medicine at St. Joe's. Uh, in hindsight, we, we should have invited you as well to co-host uh, for this morning, so really glad that you've been able to attend and participate, and delighted to see that we have other members of our Department of Surgery, uh, such as Dr. Kana, who were able to join this morning. Um, this is really an opportunity for uh, multidisciplinary work, isn't it? Um, I don't know if there was a question in there or if there were some comments or, or response from the presenters. 
I think there is one more question in the chat that maybe Sandra want to comment if citizen is approved in other countries and if so it was possible to get the supplementing manufacturers. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Citizen is a really interesting drug in, in the sense that it's been in use for many years since the 50s, 60s in Eastern Europe. Outside of that area is not as widely used. So um, there's been trials that have looked at it in Poland and then more recently in New Zealand and in Australia, although it's not approved in those regions yet. Currently, there's a company called Achieve Life Sciences that's trying to get the drug out of Eastern Europe back into Western, into the Western um, countries. And there's they've done a couple of trials and they're currently doing a phase three trial in the US, hoping to get FDA approval for this medication in the US. So to answer the question, outside of Eastern Europe, most other countries don't have it approved. Um, but in Canada, it's approved as a health product for smoking cessation. And patients can actually obtain it from some pharmacies, um, on, either online or in some pharmacies. But the thing is, many people don't know about it, even as it's approved as a health product here. So we're hoping that we, you know, if we can establish its effectiveness in a trial, and that will help to push this conversation about it um, forward. So um, yeah, so in terms of getting the manufacturer to supply, supply us the medication, we've contacted some of the companies that produce it. Um, and as I said earlier, we are gonna contact the Canadian company that supplies it in Canada. They're not producing it, they just, they just have the license to supply it from, get it from the manufacturers and supply it in Canada. So we're still exploring that. Okay. Thank you so much. I see. Thanks, Dr. Borges, for uh, putting that in the chat there. And I don't know if you want to say a few more words uh, to that point. If you're um, looking to have other members join your team, this is a good platform to reach out. Yeah, so I just want to say some final words, and I want to echo Rahima. Um, saying that we really need support because we are a multidisciplinary um, discipline. And in perioperative care, there's so much room uh, in clinical work and also in research perspective. Uh, we always need support from different areas. So we work with anesthesia, we work with surgery, we work with internal medicine, and we are very glad that we are starting to build this group. And we are very open if anyone wants to be part of it, either on research, on from clinical perspective, or from both, just reach out to us um, and we'll be very happy to engage you in anything that you would like to participate. So thanks so much for the opportunity. It was a wonderful round. Um, and while well, looking forward to keep working with Sancho's uh, research and, and clinical perioperative care. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us this morning for um, all of the work that you did in prepping those excellent talks and, and delivering really high quality updates and, uh, and we'll all stay tuned for um, what's to come with all of your research initiatives. Um, uh, thanks to everybody who's joined us this morning. We'll be back again next week at 8 a.m. And uh, next week we have Dr. Jason Chung who uh, is a member of our GIM service and in fact, the head of service. And his title for his talk is Oski Wee Wee, Oski Wawa, Lessons Learned from a Team Internist. Uh, so that should be very interesting. Um, and in the meantime, I wish you all a wonderful week. Take care. Thanks so much for having us. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.